as you can see, he's a professor at, at the IIT in Gandhi Nagar in Gujarat. He is an expert in archaeology and in ethnography, and he's particularly studied not just indigenous people, but indigenous technologies. Actually, he's here in Madras to speak on iron in Tamil Nadu um, from the, the Kiladi excavations. Uh, he has written 14 books, 80 articles, one journal, and he has traveled around the world. He's lectured at universities around the world. He's also an adjunct professor at Flinders University in Australia. And we are very, very happy to have you with us. I met him at the CSMVS Museum in Bombay. Um, he was one of the participants on conservation. So Alok, over to you. Thank you. I started traveling to Naga. The first travel was 96. And if I could correlate something, when I got down from the uh, plane there, I could only correlate myself to what I read about British administration in India. You see more of the police, more of the security people than of the local Nagas. And that was my beginning. And of course, started going to interiors to, to an extent that I was made a witness to something which you are seeing on my first slide. Uh, I'll come back to this slide in the end. I would just want you, all of you, to count the number of people in the slide. You, all of you can count the number of people in the slide and keep it to yourself. I'll come back to the last talk. So all of you have seen the number of people. And this picture is taken in 2006, not much before. 2006, December 14th is the date. And that's right in the border village of India and Myanmar. And what I'm going to talk to you today is not being in a museum, I'm going to talk to you, is collection and display is the last thing a museum should do? Or is there anything more? Is it like we have to bring the people to the museum? That should be the only objective? Okay, we make some public awareness program, we make some mobile exhibitions, that's all? Or what? The concept like telling the truth, what wrong we have done as an educated mass who collected the material, uh, if we can correct that. And if we can correct that, is it the required to be activist to correct that? Or you need to think as a scientifically or as an academician, which I come from an academic institute. My training has been in Deccan College, which is known to be a research center. I'm neither an activist uh, nor something that I want to see a museum in a glass. Each object has their own story to speak. Each object has the variable meaning and a dynamic meaning which changes from not only season to season, not group to group, but even in morning the meaning of the object become different, in evening the meaning of the object become different. Are we going to collect only the things which will make curiosity among the audience? Or we need to be that answerable that we present the culture the way they are, how it should benefit the people from where do we collect it. It is curiosity is which is driving force in most of the museum collection. Uh, that's a dilemma. The object which looks very odd, the object which looks very august, we display that. If you, I want to display something which is related to dance, without the weapons has to be presented, a skull presentation is something wrong if you cannot present the different meaning of that skull. Everybody in, the, in this gathering also, if I say, uh, what do you think about Nagas? First thing you will say, they are colorful people. Many would say, they do various activities. Most of you will say, we know Nagas as headhunters. None of them will say, the headhunting was not to show the powers, but it was part of the fertility, and all the community in Indian tradition have done that. We call it headhunting, here we call it other suicide, we call it sacrifice. In my own childhood, um, my family used to sacrifice different animals. 
that was never counted as if I am presented, I am a current community from Orissa. If I am presented, I am presented as a trader around the world. The Orissa Utkal people, they used to trade with the Southeast Asia. But if Naga is presented, I am giving an example of Nagas through this. Naga is presented, they are presented, okay, they are colorful people, but you do not talk about the knowledge system. Would you say that they are isolated community, if you say they are not isolated community, rather than, the, rather than saying they are isolated community, start saying they are sovereign community. Start saying they are independent of each other. They, were, they didn't require us, the non-Nagas. We required them. It is other way around. They were very much independent and they were very much connected. If they were not connected in the excavation site, which dates to now 3,000 year old, 3,700 year old, say, they, you are getting the carnelian, you are getting the thing which was known for long trading thing. And those carnelian either comes from Myanmar side or comes from combat. And another thing I would say, in the combat, if you start talking the name of that bead, which is long, hexagonal bead on which I will come sometime, that is known as Deja and that's a Angabi word. That's not a Gujarati word, that's not a Hindi word, that's not a Sanskrit word either. So the, those communities, and those are found in 3,700 year old AMS dated site. But we don't talk about that. It's an isolated community. Rather than that, start saying sovereign community. Start saying they're self-dependent community. Start saying that what they needed, they had it. Urbanization is a concept which we are giving it. But if I can do my own work, I don't need you. Then, coming to the example what I would give in this lecture, because Naga is such a vast topic, or decolonization or decontextualization, what I would speak is such a vast topic that I would only take example of the collections, mostly in German, because I have worked on many of the Naga collection in UK, US, and entire Europe. I'm taking example of German only. Before that, uh, this is something I had written in 2007, and probably I was young, and I had more courage to write the truth. I was not into academic institute. I didn't have to bow in front of my director, why did you dare to write something? What I wrote is that if an investigation is carried out on ethnographic collection, in entire world, not only in India, not only in Nagaland, not only in Asia, you will find the ratio, the number of people colonized by the Britishers, if you take a Britishers example, colonized Britishers, and the number of artifacts which are collected from there, undoubtedly Naga will be the most number. The number of people Britishers administrated are not beyond Pangsa, maximum 50,000 families. And the number of objects in British itself is more than 50,000. And all those objects which they collected from the Nagas when it was an unequal society. The people who were collecting were well educated. They, all, of, all of them were ICS. In the standard of those days, they were ICS in the Nagaland because they were not first class. All of them passed with a third class. Let it be J.H. Otten or let it be J.P. Mills. Only Hemindroff was a bigger scholar as anthropologist. J. Chaton, if you look at it, it's like diary, you look at it. Because they didn't get it to anything, they came to, but they were ICS. They were well educated. And they were already aware about museum movement because the 19th century was the museum movement for the entire Europe. And all the big people, all the people who had money, all the tea merchant, all the people, industrialists, were trying to make their own personal collection, which became later on the bigger collection. If you look at Petri Bors, if you look at Horniman Museum, you go to Cambridge University Museum, these all were personal collection, they became a bigger collection. And fortunately or coincidentally, I would not say use the call unfortunately, coincidentally, all of them who gave the collection to the museum became professor. And uh, their retirement was all of them. If it is Jay Chotan, or if it is Hemindrov, or it is J.P. Mills, or if it is Urthrop, all of them, after going from Nagaland, they went, they, the collection of, of amount of, I'll talk about the number of objects which they were giving, and they became the professor in Oxford University, and uh, getting a Oxford University professorship has its own, own merit and own standard of getting it. And this is what you are seeing, collection of Hemindroff. When Hemindroff, everybody knows Hemindroff contributed a lot, he wrote the 
one of the very good book called Naked Naga. But the book cover page in India was different than the book cover page which was uh, sold in Germany. And the book cover page in Germany was a cabaret dancer. And that same lady, I will get into that, the how it was presented, the line drawing, I will get into that. But he was in a witching village which had 700 houses. That's all it had. The book came out of that in Naked Naga is from that village, witching village. When he leaves from that village, look at the amount of collection he does it. You cannot see the end. And all of the, what you are seeing, the bag which, on which they were carrying the material, the, all were the material which the Nagas acquired. I can buy a Louis Philippe shirt in being here because I want to buy a Louis Philippe. You, I can buy tomorrow noon, I don't like a Louis Philippe, I want a cotton dress, I will buy it. Among Nagas, it's not like that. You need to do certain social duty to acquire that kind of artifacts or ornaments as a part of your lifestyle. If I want to wear a specific kind of cloth or a number of cowries or number of designs, I have to do that many fertility. I need to bring that many bhello to the village. It was always a community. And it is in which form you have to bring, that's a different thing, that's differs from tradition to tradition. We have got, we are no one to decide that. It was Nagas to decide on which form, but then nothing they buy it. Nothing a villager would be able to, because he has money, will buy it. The societal sanction is required for any material addition to their presentation. The way they would dress, what they would wear, the carving they would do in the house, that all will be decided on the contribution they do to the society. In a better sense is that how much fertility or whatever society they bring it. What is counted there? When Hemindraf collects those material, that means he is not only collecting the artifacts for a museum, he is displacing the history because history of the Nagas were not written. Nagal has got many languages. They have got 30 languages, 300 dialect, but not written script. Written script come only in 1970, 72 rather to be precise. Before that, it was all written in Roman language and that was our Bible. But when you are displacing, it is not, coll collection is a different thing, and but collecting the entire village material, is it displacing? The entire, not only, you are not displacing the material culture, you are robbing for, for them to write their own history, to know about their own origin. How do you know about the origin of a, of a community without seeing their material culture in context? And this, the amount of collection has gone to that level, that in in UK itself, there are 20,000 registered objects, and there are 50,000 unregistered objects, and it is not the British started collection, the Germans started the collection. It started in 1878 by none other than Father Adlov Bastian. Adlov Bastian, who comes in 1978, sorry, 1878, when he lives in 1878 from Nagaland back to Germany, he gives S.C. Pele a Three chairman, 500 rupees. Just put multiply 500 rupees every five year. Come to today, the amount it becomes you can buy a village. Gives 500 rupees. That age and when you see a material, you collect it for. Having said that, but there was some anthropology behind that. And the, to the people who are not aware of Naga geography, this slide comes. The Nagas they don't only live in Nagaland. They do live in Nagaland mostly, but then they have Manipur, Arunachal Pradesh, Myanmar, and Assam. A good percentage of them live in that place. And there are not only 14 subgroups, because 14 subgroups are officially known, so we are taught as 14, but there are 30 subgroups. Age of now, we know there could be much, much more. And they have about 300 dialects and 30 languages. How such diversity happened in a small area? Okay. Then the problem also comes in the Nagaland is uh, the fundamental question or the research problem which you have to know who are Nagas. That has been the fundamental. And uh, 
to reach that fundamental, answering that fundamental question, we have been doing agriculture study, anthropology study, linguistic study, uh, archaeological study. Probably the one day we can answer when we combine DNA, anthropology, archaeology, linguistic, then we can probably say something on that. But until then, if, as I, as I said you, how do you say who are Nagas? By seeing present day Nagas? or by seeing their cultural artifacts and their culture contact. Only answer is their culture contact. Only answer is their objects, which are no, which provenance of those objects, which are from different places, what are their contrasts? That would be the only way. Uh, but it is, they have been played upon by this museum specialist, specialist or anthropologist for such a long period that many generation gap has taken place. It is way back in 1873, when the Innerland Permission was introduced, they were excluded from world knowledge system. Their knowledge system, their culture contact, whatever was there in 1873, we started introducing, forcing a Innerland Permission. A Innerland Permission to whom? Without their understanding. Then starts, followed up with that, is the major collections. The collection, Two and, as I said, the collections are not in number. One example I showed you of Hemindrop. Everybody goes, their collection. And there are, when there is firing, you are seeing that, that is a pangsa. The fire which the photograph is the pangsa fire. What is it firing? When the pangsa expedition takes place, Hemindrop goes and he comes back, that pangsa firing takes place. What is he firing? Look at the left hand side photograph. That is a photograph taken by Otto Ehler in 1890. A, a house. A house which is of has 500 years of history. A house, the car, each carving will tell you how that carving took place. Not only that because of the craftsmanship, but the social sanction that village, that person, the owner of that house has got it. That social sanction, why did he get that social sanction? And how that social sanction is related to Southeast Asia or uh, broader India, that you would know by noting those. And if that, and that house in Nagaland is never complete house. Because you attain completing those carving, again with the social sanction, by doing different kind of duties, different kind of uh, contribution to the society or if you tell it by bringing a head of a tiger or bringing a head of an enemy or, or decorating yourself, but that has many social sanctions and those social sanctions would have helped us writing history of the Nagas. Because again you have no written history. And to write, but what you have done is that every time the Britishers, they went, if, if they, they sovereign, because again I say Nagas are sovereign people, if they want to live the way they want to live, if you decide how they should live, they revolt the new. What you do is that you burn the village. But you are not burning the village, you are burning the entire history. You are burning of, of a community, a history, you are robbing of their history, you are robbing of their origin because that was not documented. If those were still existing, it, it didn't happen only with the Britishers, and the insurgents people also, if the Nagas revolted, they burned the village. And there are many, many incidents when Indian government, Indian military also, because the Nagas didn't support, that has been born. So three people, they born on their will. The easiest way is that you say all the Nagas live, leave the village. If you all are there, you just fire it because it's an organic culture. And what are you burning is entire thing which they have inherited. In our case, if you want to make this house, we call the architect, we call the person, tell that you make this design. Nagas, they don't do that. They make a house, each time the carving takes place, again it's a social sanction. It takes years. If you give a seven feast of merit, how many generations must have taken place? So what you are burning is that it is, it is like, till 1947 they were closed because of this inner land permission. After 1947, when, when it was opened, the Nagaland was opened for the outsider to come in, of course, again, after 1947, it, only for 10 years or 20 years, they could open, then they closed down. Again, they opened in 96 only. But when Nagaland was open to the outer world, their material culture, you had already displaced because you have taken almost all of their material culture to different museums across the world. And another coincidence happens. Every time you have a record, 
of this burning of the Naga villages. Just following that, you will see a shipment going from Bombay. Next year, a shipment, and a shipment reaching to some museum, and this is official record I'm talking about. I'm not talking about from my aid. And those records, I'll just bring it with some example, is what is happened, who all collected it? The collection of cultural objects, or uh, Naga Hills, had been etched to a large scale to find the original material today, hardly with any natives. What you see, which has come, when the opening of communication took place. What you see among the Naga society is which has come there after 1842, uh, when the first father comes in. What you see, most of the findings are there, are not before 1842, and specifically not before 1873, when inner land permission took place, people started bringing wool, red color, which is, when you go to Nagaland these days, all the spears, you might be having different in the museum, they are red wool but it used to be red goat hair. When wool started, the one example is that wool started displacing the red goat hair, and that's where the cloth also have changed. Anything you are seeing, because they were very fond of red color, on red color I give a different talk altogether, so it is not something I'm talking of. So you start replacing that by giving them a bunch of wool. And that bunch of wool has played a bigger role in changing the cultural material of Naga society because wool becomes so common, and because that could be produced in such a large scale, that became like everybody started making their earring in red color. Red color was very famous with them, and everybody started designing their spear with red color, everybody started designing their salts with the red wool. But that was not the fact. Fact is that originally they had this red goat head. Fact is that they had this uh, hornbill feathers. And then you have many important, some of the collection I'll talk of what is there is, you just list them, right from Henry Belfort uh, to Hutton to J.P. Mills or Butler or Woodthrop, all these collections are recorded. And they have been collected right from 1874 onwards, right from the Woodthrop time period. And you have this early administrator who became ethnographer and then became professors there. And how are they displayed? Naga society is full of color. Naga, one of them are mine, who wrote against the display of that. What is displayed is the, look at it, what is displayed, only the weapons and the skeletal parts. You can look at from the glass thing and the skeletal parts which you are seeing in the left hand side. Who gave you right to display the skeletal part if you cannot display the entire ecosystem of that skeletal collection? If you cannot display the days behind the skeleton, if you cannot display the entire ecosystem, the entire environment of the entire village, why that head was there, then don't display the head only. A person come from Brazil or a person from ABC who do, who do not come to Nagaland, who do not see the colorful Naga hills, who do not see the beauty of Nagaland, who do not understand the knowledge of Nagas, who do not understand their knowledge system, which is much better than mine, and but the, what they see, they say, okay, they're head on trust, they keep the arrow in their eye socket. It is they who kept it. It is we who stopped them that you cannot keep. Keeping a human head now among Naga society is illegal. There are many villages which I gave you the burning example. Those burning have taken place in record because they had human skull in their villages after in 1936 when government of India, the then British government, banned that. If they, if they are not allowed to keep their skull, which is part of their tradition, which none of us understood during that time, that was not only head hunting as a matter of valor, but it was a matter of fertility part. And if they are not allowed, who are you to keep it? Because it generates money, because it brings you tourists. If you are keeping it, if you are able to keep the long canoes and long pillows of American natives or Australian people there, then why don't you keep a log drum there? Which museum, most of you who must have been to a different museum in Petriburs or Cambridge or British Museum or even in different museum in Indian Delhi Museum or Calcutta Museum, why haven't they kept a log drum? Why haven't they showing the entire house? Why are not they showing they able to put 16 houses of 16 architecture, different architecture? Is it not our house is different than the Angami house? Is it not Konyak house is different than the Tuensang people? They are different. You show that part of the Nagas also. Who 
Who gave you right to only show the skull which you have you have abandoned, you have banned that to be in, in their own village. You have, you have banned that keeping their in own dormitory which is a cultural house, which is the real museum, then what museum you have made it? So the display, what are you displaying? And how should you display? That has to come from now within the people from where you have collected. That was way back, I would also give you an example is that this display, I should say this display is now during COVID time, they did withdraw the skeletal material now, only representative skeletal there. This is just before COVID time, these photographs. And then the most important, we, we have a good Naga candidate here. Uh, all this skeletal material which they have, they are in hundreds. In, there are cases where they are still with, with the skin and the hair, it is there. And in all those skulls behind which village it is written, none of them have any human evolution value. None of them are going to give you anything to do with science rather than by displaying what I said, object of curiosity. And they are not even kept in the chest height. You can see the height of the skeletal, they are kept on the knee height. If the curator, him or herself of that museum will keep his or her own forefather in a knee height, I will be happy to accept it. And when they were collected, those materials were collected for different museums, Nagas didn't know what is called museum movement. They had got no knowledge for what they were getting collected. They only were giving to their babus. And that become unequal society. Now, Nagas are well educated. They know where are their material. And to take this photograph, each object photograph, I have to pay 10 pounds. For what? Of my own culture? Of my own people? Whom you have brought the material culture for 100 years? You have been earning money from that? If you say, you can argue, many people argue with me, no, in London Museum, there is no ticket for museum visit. London economy is, 40% is museum only. London economy is tourism. That tourism is because, only London I'm saying, I'm not talking about UK. That tourism is because of the 40 public museum there. So it is, anyway you have been earning for 100 years. It's, I'm just giving an example of London, it could be of any ABC. But then, who are you to ask price for it? How many Nagas can go and do a research on their own material? Um, then you say, no, we have scholarship. We have scholarship for two people. You have scholarship for 10 people. Today there are few lakhs Nagas who wants to know about their own past. Materials are not here. So it's, don't put it, then what you have born again I'm showing you, this is the carving. And each carving, and if, I, if at all age, 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 again and again I'm saying Naga history is not known, Naga origin not known, if at all I would have to know, this is my crucial data. This carving is my crucial data because not only this is a Mithun carving, not only this is a carving, a hornbill thing, but who all are making that? And the method they are applying, that I would know if this structure would have been alive or would have survived till now. And what we have born is these houses and what we have taken is this material culture, this is Hammer. And most of the cases, where, when this is, this is what I'm showing you, this is the Adler Bastian collection in Germany. But then he probably, he was one of the best anthropologists one could think of. When he came in 1878, he lists 222 objects needed to be collected and all are representative collection. Nothing called like, I want five pieces of those. And then, if this was when, when this right hand side picture was, sorry, right, this picture was there, this is published in Hemindra book, we, we used it as a, it is a hammer used for, like as an archaeologist uses a hammer stone uh, to make something. But originally, till now, if you go towards Myanmar side, you see the anvil which is down, we are seeing, those all are people used to carry those to the forest when they go for hunting, when they go for any of the subsistence economy, they would carry that along with them and when the, you are Dao or anything, they would sharpen it there. It is not a hammer stone to hammer and knot. It is not an agricultural tool. 
But in almost all the archaeological evidence, what you see, this part, it's an agricultural tool. And in all the museum, what you see, this is in the village, and this is in the museum, in Ethnologist Museum of Germany. Now it's called Humboldt Forum. It has moved to Humboldt Forum. When I took the photograph, it was in Ethnologist Museum in Germany. But original, the functional use of that varies. People still use those hammer to make sharpen their tools. It is not breaking a knot. It is not making an agricultural tool the way entire museum system talks of, entire academia talks of. This is past German anthropology which I talk of. This is the museum where the his collections are there. Uh, I, rec I don't know, I consider him as the <coughs> trained anthropologist who came in 1878, 79 to the Naga Hills, uh, and he collects few material. He doesn't collect anything called, he didn't collect uh, any, any material in numbers. Then he makes a list of the object which he wanted, exactly 220 object. He hands over 500 rupees. You can see that that is from his diary. 500 rupees in 1878 to a tea merchant that this, this material I need whenever you get, you collect it. 500 rupees is really a too big amount. Too big amount in 1878. None had five. I think Jamidas didn't have 500 rupees in 1878. Rupees was equivalent to pound those days. And the, if that is called anthropological collection, I have my own doubt. And this is the place where his collection are there in 1878. This is his diary from where I have collected those data which I talked of. I didn't talk of. This is, of course, written in archaic German. And it is fortunate and that uh, I learned some of the German Dutch language before becoming a Humboldt fellow. It was a compulsory thing, so I learned. And surprisingly, I started opening certain uh, boxes or certain almiras which were closed from during first world war. And this is one of them. When you start working there, you, they will give you some apron and rest, and 45 minutes you will work, and two hours you have to go to open space for the air thing. Because during First World War and Second World War, they put spread DDT inside, because they didn't know what is called conservation method. Those days, that was the conservation method. They have spread DDT inside, and they closed, sealed it with the, all the different variety of material then available. And those Almira, what you're seeing, for the first time, I'm opening in 2012 to 14. Okay. 125 year material remained there. It was never displayed. And this, this Almira, what you are seeing, okay, I have not come to that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> In this Almira, what you are seeing, this cupboard says agricultural basket. That's all it says. So everything to me is agricultural basket. Everything to every scholar, every museum visitor for 125 years has been agricultural basket. Is it not true? Which is written agricultural basket. There are the captions, agriculture basket, and it, it remained like that. Okay. But then when I started working on, when I was working on Nagas, I was in the Chui village, a village which is not far, it is in the Mon district. You can see the basket on the top of a bed, temporary bed, inside the Ong. Ong is the, the, the then village king in the village. And another thing you see, another photograph, is I attended a marriage of the then deputy collector, who, who in a Sigwang village, when you see, you can see there is a basket right, right inside. And this basket has no grain. And neither all the, any of those baskets has grain. They have got nothing to do with agriculture. Look at that photograph closely of what is there. If you have a pointer, I would be able to see. You look at the difference between this basket and this basket. This is what I am showing you. This is this two. And this, this other agricultural basket as of now. This is agricultural basket. But this one, this one and this one. Just see the shape of that and see the stand of that. That stand is given because inside that people keep ornament. Right when a child is born, a basket will be given to them. And the day of her marriage, inside this basket, you get this. And all this basket also an ornament, but those ornaments can only be opened during festival. Because during festival, the Ong will allow, that's a public property, public. 
So functional use of that, even if that much is not collected, the data about those objects, the da those, those objects were collected in such a hurry that the contextual details are not written. Forget about dynamic and variable meaning. The meaning of that basket itself is not for anything called agriculture, because for agricultural basket, they are made differently. They are made of the cane. These baskets are made of bamboo. They, because they don't require to carry the weight. Agricultural basket would require to carry the weight, and they would require a head belt. But this basket itself, I am giving a few examples, and another thing I would say is that still you have collected a lot of uh, these scots, and you say, no, they were using beef in those days. I don't think, I think had you not collected, uh, I will recall a talk of between me and Brigade Alchin. Uh, Alchin was a famous archaeologist, both couple, they, unfortunately they have expired now. After they expire, if I have to say, because it is in recorded in Petri Bosch Museum when I was giving a talk, Alchin sir asked me, um, uh, I was very young. <laughs> so, uh, I, I started talking, not using anthropological term, but using the term like cultural looting or those type of wording I was using. Then he said, uh, Kanungo, you think, had we not collected the material, the material would have been there in the society. Uh, yes, I took a pause. Then I said, but who started the collection? So this answer you have to give. Who, who started the collection? You started the collection, you would have to answer. Had you not collected, that collection might not have been, material might have been there only. And then I said, this, look at this society, they are still using those. And they are using those, if, if you ask them, why are you using this uh, Scott on this particular day, they would say you that on this date, on this moon, on when the sun is this side, when the moon is this side, on the star is this side, when the rain is this much, if I wear it, this will give me more cultivation. So the calculation of the entire ecosystem, the calculation of weather forecasting, the calculation, that is also part of their society. And whereas you have, then you talk of uh, this oat, um, collections of cowries. Okay, uh, the closest uh, thing as an archaeologist I have talk, which culture is cowries? Number of cowries. I am talking of prehistory, Harappa, Charcolithic, uh, then we talk of early history. Which society, which cultural period? has that many of cowrie, how much cowrie Nagas use. Any guess? Cell and cowrie are marker of Harappan civilization. And we have told, taking that as a criteria of urbanization. Go to any Naga rural or Naga real village, ask the uh, traditional dress, each dress will have cowries, and the number of line of cowries have, will have different story. In certain community, you are allowed to have a one line of cowry. In certain communities, you are not allowed to have one line of cowry if you have not killed an enemy. In certain society, you are allowed to have three lines because you have killed an enemy, you have brought fertility, or you have made more given feast of merit, feast of merit means you are a good cultivator, good cultivator again is related to their ancient science, ancient knowledge system, they were able to judge when the rain will happen, they could do the cultivation and that cultivation is in a way they give as a feast of merit, they feed the entire village. Feast of merit has a different meaning, it, they are feeding the entire village for few days. That is distribution of wealth. It is not only feast of merit to show your, whom are you showing the wealth? I am living in the same village for generations. Whom should I show? What is there for me to show? I am part and parcel of the village which is 500 people, 50 villages. Each village is of 50 houses or 100 houses. Whom am I showing? I am not showing. I am distributing my earning which I made. If I have made more earning, I am distributing that, making it entire community equal. I'm feeding this for seven days. That is the way the Naga society was. But then by doing that, you are entitled to have these cowries in a circle form. By 
by getting enemy here, you are entitled to have a cowry in a V form. That represents, that V is represent fertility, this is what you are saying. That represents fertility, that could be in human head form, that could be tiger head form, that could be elephant head form, that's a different, but then you have different people wearing that. If this can be owned by a leader which has bought fertility, the commoner can use only this cowries. But both of them are in museum. And this, the lengutha, the lower one, is of different community, and the upper one is of different community. Who will talk that? Who will tell in that museum, this soul which you are displaying, it is not a beauty, it is not only saying about long distance trading because it has cowries, because cowries are not found there, the nearest source of cowry would be 5,000 kilometers from there, and it is not only that long distance trading, it is the entire story. That this, this apron which you have is meant for different people and the soul which are meant for different people, even if it is of the same village, same community, same tribe, still the, the soul can be put by somebody who have given feast of merit for generations. These three cowries, these three bishop, these three feast of merit. Feast of merit is like your like entire income of your life spends in a so this one who has owned this soul, this is the person you can see, who has owned this soul must have hereditary, must have served the society. Then you have to equate that in which community they do such thing. Are the Borneo people doing it? Or people from Taiwan doing it? Or people from other country doing it? Then you start relating it. But these materials are now no more in Naga society. And then, as again I would say, uh, after Edlop Bastian goes back to Germany, he assigns Otto Heller uh, to collect these two twenty objects. You can see he lists the objects. Uh, of course, it's in archaic German, it's written. He lists the objects, very, very uh, professional, not like Britishers where I showed you 50,000 objects, very professional, this many objects I need and collect it. And Otto Heller comes to, uh, in 1918, 90s he comes and this is, Again, his diaries, his tour guide, but unfortunately, he, he returns to Africa and he expires there before he giving this material. Again, the diaries which he had collected is not a contextual collection. The best thing what he has done is some of the oldest photograph taken from the Naga, interior Nagas are there. This is 120 photographs. And worst thing what he has done, he or any of the traveler used to come they used to come in the name of Naga. Because Naga was a selling point. You would say, I'm going to, it's like an adventure. I want a grant from a queen and king, they would give it if you are going to Naga, not to Orissa. They would give it if you are not coming to Tamil Nadu, but going to, because that is the time period where ethnographic museum across the world, across the western world, were taking safe. So everybody would expect, if he goes, he will collect this much of material, and those material would they would interpret as a material of curiosity and from an adventure field. And so most of the time, what is happening is that they would take the material and conserve that to display in a beautiful form. Look at one headgear which he has. This is Otto Heller, again one of the best anthropologists. He took the collection and displays like this, all original, uh, what do you call, hornbill feather. And you have this headgear, which has bare skin, that is good enough as of now. And there are two representations of horn. They are, those horns have stripe mark. What he did is that one head horn had the stripe mark, other didn't have originally, but to make it a better display, painted. And that is therefore 125 years. And for 125 years, again, those photographs which he had collected, because those days you take the photograph and print them from the slide, and those photographs are kept in a box. They are also not open. None took interest because following that, Maya civilization was discovered. And everybody, all the resources were put to Maya civilization. People forgot this Asia. And then after the Maya civilization, we have other civilization of First World War and Second World War. Then nothing was open. And to open each of these photographs, each photograph to open and conserve as per the museum protocol, cost, did cost me 280 euro. Because you have to keep it flat, keep it through conservation process, and 280 euro for an Indian is huge money. 120 photographs I didn't, 
I could do some eight, or, of course, in, in due course of time, we did open those. There are two interesting things we got. Out of eight photographs, one photograph, look at it, the person you wearing that headgear, same headgear who has collected, that was also there. That means you are seeing that person, you are not writing the material culture, you are not saying that how did you got this headgear, how, who gave you, what was the tradition behind that, what the story behind that, then you photograph that, because photograph was also new, then you are buying that. Okay, you bought it, you didn't ask them. And you found one horn is looking different than the rest, and it is not looking good for display, you paint the other one. Look at the original one, which is wearing this one. One horn is still not painted. He didn't understand that that painting would take, would be only possible after certain deed which he has to do in the society. This, each stripe represent one head for them. And I'm not going to human head or animal head, each head is considered as you brought fertility to my village. Or each stripe you can give after giving one feast of merit by feeding the entire village. Or by sponsoring during the stone pulling. There are many factors responsible for it. The entire story becomes different. Otto Heller collects the museum and that was not known for 125 years. Neither I would have known because I go to Naga villages like me, many people go and I was only, it was coincidence that when I started opening some photograph, one photograph here, yeah, this headgear is in the display, it was in display in Bessel because that was the only, only exhibition they have done in 2005 from that collection and that was display that, I mean, it, it is very, you know, an object which is attracted everybody. But none knew the original story <laughs> that this is, no, this is not the original from Nagas, but it is customized from the Nagas. Okay. Then, when you collect this photograph, you also see one photograph of hair where this, this log drum, if you look at closely, this log drum is in the shape of canoe. It's in the shape of canoe. It's not in, not in the shape of boat also. Who saw a canoe in 1892 he had come. If Naga is a landlocked place, if Naga were not in touch with the rest of the world because they were indeed, they were only collecting their material because when they needed, then how could a material which is so close to their cultural lifestyle is in a shape of a canoe? It's, a canoe will run on what? Not on river, they would make a boat safe. There, there are streams in Nagaland. There are lakes, few. But you don't have a sea. And this log drum, which you can see from the very close, the log drum itself is that old. When he has taken the photograph, it looks itself 500 years old. But it's exactly on the shape of canoe. And the closure photograph was, you can see it was getting cracked here. But next time, when this is the canoe safe. So that again gives you cultural affinities. And out of this photograph, again, another story happened. When you open those photographs, as an anthropologist, I could see only 20% of those photographs of Nagas. Remaining all are non-Nagas. They come to Assam, right, but get the grant on the non Naga. Whoever looks like those are Apatani, whoever has a less dress says that becomes Naga to them. And very closely, I would Another good point also along with that is that uh, this Otto Heller and Bastian didn't collect skulls in number the way Hutton and Emindroff or others collected. They collected representative. Like a representative, yet a complete story because when the head hunters used to go for head hunting, if at all, then if, if our four person are there, if we didn't get four head, we get one head, then as a representative, we'll divide that. The jaw is given to somebody who has put the sort. And skull is given to other, and skull can be given to three. But if that skull, you make it a, a one entity by using a Loki. And you can see that Loki is represented as a head. 
the skull of Loki. So th that's why they have those presentations. Then another collection which in Nagaland is of Nagas in Germany is done by, um, which is in Dresden Museum, in, and that is by, again by Eller, who visited in 1870, and then you have in Munich, I'm not going to talk in the detail about that. In Munich, you have this collection of um, Lucian Sherman, and Lucian Sherman also, when he collected, he kept entire collection, which you can see in a box like this, and where it is written, Naga ornaments. There is nothing called Naga ornaments. You have to say it is Konya ornaments, Ao ornament, Nangami ornament, or Twinsen ornament, you have to say that. And if this is Naga, then it is again misrepresentation, I would say. And then you have, most important, as you saw in this photograph, you can see this entire council. Both male and female wear that council. Male, Angami male will put it on the back, and Angami female will put it on the front. So it is not only a necklace. You have to say, is it male necklace? Is it female necklace? After marriage, the same male will put it in front. Is it post-marriage or pre-marriage? In effigy, in when somebody dies in the effigy, it will be only representative collection. And then you have another person called Kaufman, who was contemporary to Hemindroff. Uh, not many knows about Kaufman, but Kaufman also had collected a lot of uh, material, which is now in the Bessel Museum. And also you have a museum in coal, which has about few hundred material. And the best collection is of famous Hemindroff. 800 odd objects collected during that expedition which I showed you, that 800 objects are now in the Ethnologist Museum of Vienna, which is close to the rest of the world because they do not have at the moment economically strong enough to open that museum. What is the fault of Nagas? You collected the material from where I would know my past, where my ethos lies, where my origin lies. It is your responsibility to a bit open for Nagas. And these 800 objects, if you look at it, if these objects are some of the best in the world. You have headgears made of tiger skin, headgears made of elephant hide, headgears made of all different animal, but you do not write who is entitled to wear what. It is not that I can have a Elephant hide headgear, I can have a tiger hide headgear. My village council, my society, my community needs to recognize me that you have done this, 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 this work, you are entitled to wear that. You just keep it headgears. The objects become static. Only way you can contextualize that is probably by doing something which you had hidden for years. That is, all of you, whoever is interested in Naga must have written, read the book called Naked Naga. You have read? Ma'am, you have read the Naked Naga? Debra, ma'am? You must have read the Naked Naga book. Naked Naga by Mindroff. No. It's, in that book, then, there must be many, many stories, but one thing which has attracted everybody is Pangsa Expedition. It is because the head hunting tradition was already banned and in Pangsa, a village, which photograph I showed when the firing of the village, that was the Pangsa expedition. Pangsa, uh, J.P. Mills supports uh, Amindraf to go and record that because Pangsa village had taken few head that day so that he can record what is called head hunting festival. And then he writes in his own book, own diary, he writes, that he collects six head, which are in this, you can see in this uh, photograph right here. These heads were hanging. He collects that, and when he, when he was bringing back those skeleton, many Naga people who accompanied him. Another story goes, is, not story, fact goes is that he was accompanied with 200 sepoy to go for this expedition. 200 sepoy. And 200 sepoy are what? Nagas, Burmese, Nepalese. When he returns, there are only 80 people return. 
120 missed. For somebody who was 26 year old, who was looking for a PhD topic, who was given 200 sipai as a security guard or as a protection, which Indians were given? If you say no, Indians didn't work, who were given that much of support? And for that expedition, they lose 120 people. Same record, same register on which 100, 200 people sign behind when they return, 80 people records are there. And that's, that's taking me something beyond. And in that diary, he says that this six call he brings, then he realizes that he can never know what Nagas are doing after head hunting. How was that festival? How would we record it? Then he distributes those calls back to the different villages who were supporting the Britishers. And then he cuts those. It's again an ethical issue that who gave you right to cut a Nagas call? That's a different ethical issue, which I'm not bringing in this lecture. But then he gives the diary says he has written those six calls. Then he talks about the entire chapter about head hunting festival rituals, the book has. Okay. Then he takes 800 objects. In the diary, in the registry, which talks about 800 objects, no mention of skull. It is me only standing there with those skulls which are hanging here. The skulls are very much in Vienna Museum. So the book, which you con many of us considered as a Bible on the Nagas, Konyak Naga, Naked Naga, Return of Naked Naga, which made really to all anthropological syllabus, the foundation itself is not truth. He talks about Siskal, he says that the skull he returned to the Nagas and they made the festival and he wrote down the entire chapter. And that means the skulls were not with him. The skulls are very much in the Vienna Museum and you can even see the skull, you can make out which skull it is. And it was, okay, I don't know if second time when I go to the room, they would allow me inside or no, but then I do, you do have records and I was a bit young, I had hair and whatever. Then, and it's not me only saying the story. When we discussed to the curator, curator wrote a paper on that because I was not entitled to write that story because I was not entitled to toss this skull as for the, my agreement. But then he wrote a paper saying that these skulls came from where we do not know, but it is in the Hemindraf collection. And Hemindraf in the real story says, he, in his entire life he tossed six skull, he gave it six skull back to Pansas to record that. This is anthropology. Then it comes to Milada Ganguly, who, who was the only person, because um, he was Rabindranath Tagore's daughter-in-law, and uh, so he had access. When nobody was able to go to Naga Hills, she could go to Naga Hills and do a lot of work. She did a very good, two very good book um, on Nagas. And then, but unfortunately again, hair collections are not in India, they are in Switzerland in Basel, which you are seeing those. And this tiger skin seal, again, must be a ceremonial screen. Who is this tiger thing? Tiger skin thing? And again, it is a saman. And this headgear is of saman, and you have this representation. That, and another thing which, which this museum have, is certain replicas. In 1934, uh, I'm forgetting the name. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll come to his name quickly. Paul Uich. Paul Uich, again, who was a German scholar, who comes, he collects, he comes a line of jeeps and collects the material. In 1934 also, he was finding for death, for this grave, people are already making replicas. That means in the grave, people were not giving the original material. Because this material, by the time they reach this long columella, long carnelian, and this ornament, by the time they reach to Naga society, they are becoming so expensive that in the grave, in, during those days also, they were putting replicas. And as an archaeologist, if I start studying those what I find in grave, and I associate that to the original Naga culture, I would end up in a wrong story. So this is again a very good, that I would say, originally, this is used to be elephant 
toss, and this used to be carnelian, uh, sorry, carnelian and columella, long columella, but in those days also, wooden replicas and replica of these ornaments were available. And those all have gone to grave because the original metal were already displaced by 1936. People were not giving the original to the grave, they were giving replicas to the grave. And those graves, if I start excavating today, which you do, and we get it, then we say this is part of their culture. Then again, in the, there is a big collection in the, in the France, which I will not come into. And in Netherlands, again, you see the skeletal material, which is there in the display. Uh, and originally, this skeletal material, none are supposed to touch, only king family can touch it. Okay, I was not a king, but I went there in 2000. So you could touch that. And those skeletal material which are there, they don't understand. The entire skeletal material which are say, they are not head hunted hard. These skulls are of one family of the king family. When king family, king expires, his son expires, there is a cyst burial which you get. Cyst burial you get mostly in the south India also, in that they will keep the skull. That leads, leads me to another problem, which is how we have caption. Look at this place where I said you that when I started working on that, those, you can see this is the sealed Almira, and this is unsealed, this one is sealed. This seal was done during First World War and Second World War. I opened that, and to use those material, I have to go through those apron. Uh, for 45 minutes, I would work, and then inside it will become danger symbol, like you are working on your own risk. That is fine. That risk was good enough to me. What was bad to me is seeing certain thing, it's called Mirinaga. There is nothing called Mirinaga. Miri are different community. There is Apatani Naga. Because for 125 years, when, people, when Nagaland became a different distinct uh, state or distinct district from the Assam, and people started doing a lot of research saying that this is Naga community, these are not Naga community, there is Kuki Naga, there is Miri Naga captions. They remained there. Nobody worked on those. So this is like losing the, if, if in a way, the Naga cultural elements are going more, and the Miris are losing their own identity in foreign country. This material culture is of Miri Naga. This material culture is of Miris. There are cookies, there are Apatanis. They become Nagas there. It's not only that you are misrepresented in Naga culture, you are also making the Miris, the cookies, the Apatanis lose their own cultural identity in a foreign country. So what is the solution now? If this is the scenario, what would be the solution? I would say combine is this 2,000 objects example which I gave you today. There are about lakhs of objects, 2,000 objects from uh, Germany which I'm talking of. In Germany, which are collected before much assimilation of culture has never been displayed in museum yet been exchanged with many collections. In Second World War, I also worked on Russian collection where materials have gone as a war boutique. We in Russia dominated the Western Germany and they took the material from the different museum as a war boutique. Material went from watching village, for an example, or some village from Nagas without their knowledge. They didn't know for what you are collecting. They were not educated. Now they are educated. At least they have the intellectual right on the object. You might have the right property of its material ownership, but intellectual right remains with the Nagas. If they do not know where the material, where you have taken it to London, you have given it to Germany, or you have given it, Germany has given it to Russia, is it not wrong? Where Naga should know, if tomorrow I become, like, if she wants to know about her forefather, her, if she goes to Petrobras Museum, finds for, her grandfather's uh, skull in, a, in that condition, display in that condition, either she will become a psyche or she will break that glass by, she will say that break the law of the UK. I won't be able to see my own father's skull standing there, everybody taking photograph where my uh, father's skull is on the eye socket, whereas his all colorful life is not represented. How would one Naga be, be up to that? And the same thing is happening is that my material from my village is gone without my knowledge, where are they? When I become educated enough because it is your responsibility to 
rather as a curator, as a museum owner, your responsibility is only to maintain that. You are a mediator. You have to maintain that until I become educated enough to know about my own culture. Then right is mine. If I am another. It is, and the way out is, what is the way out? As a person of me, I do not know my materials are in Russia. So you are displacing that. And then you have applied hard chemicals. And the only time a few of those were, which I showed you were compiled for an exhibition was only in 2008 and 9, after 120 years. As a Naga Jewels and Ashes, just look at the title, Naga Jewels and Ashes, not, not Naga Society, at Ethnographic Museum of University of Zurich, and an extension, like I was fortunate enough to work with the person who put up the, uh, this exhibition, I, he was my mentor. And then, uh, then another thing is the extension part that was called. And in between, what has happened? When the material was collected, those time color photography was very rare, but again, Edlov Bastian was like Queen's adopted son, and Edlov Bastian has all the access. Those days, he has taken a photograph which was published in 1883 as a Naga headgear, and today the photograph I have taken the same score. Same headgear is this is the position. I took this Sema headgear in the museum in 2013. The photograph of the same headgear. You collected my headgear, which I didn't inherit, I didn't buy. I, I acquired that headgear with a lot of social responsibility. A social responsibility which is historical connotation, which will tell my past. You collected it, so it is your duty to keep it until I become educated. But how you have kept it, just see it. You, you did it. They have lost this photograph was collected by Bast this headgear was collected by Edlov Bastian when he came in 1878. And in 1883, he took a photograph and published it. In 2013, after 100 plus year, I go there and take the photograph. That headgear has nothing, no, no hair. If it is of beer head, if it is of witch head, I wouldn't know it. So if you have collected, it is your responsibility to conserve it. And, and this is only one example, there are many examples of such. And another example I would give is that I started working on grapes. I did say the grapes, grapes of commoner, grapes of uh, arms. Uh, I know when I speak, I do get a certain amount of emotion to me. And look at this photograph which you are seeing here. And everybody, okay, everybody said, no, no, no more heads are kept, but tradition in India dies very last. You go interview, you start getting, seeing it. Uh, I looked at it as an archeologist. If I get a grave, I'll do a one AM estate, two AM estate, three AM estate. Then I will make a Bayesian analysis, put it as a 500 BC or 1000 BC, whatever that comes. And then I will represent this type of skull if I get at one, inside one graph, that 29 skull. If I represent then as an archaeologist, I will represent and write it. If, if I don't have ethnographic record, then I will write it. It was a mass grave. Mohenjo-daro, there is a mass grave. Go to anywhere, then I will show there is, even in Mohenjo-daro, Aryan invasion is based on 37 skull which was found. That was the story. But look at the tradition. This cyst is open every time somebody dies of Ong's family. There is one set for female, one set for male. And then the problem starts is that I see a number of consul like screwed on the head and tied on the head. Bigger question. How do you solve it? Why would somebody play with a dead skull which you are saying you are somebody king. It is not a haunted head. Your own king. Own king is like you are worshipping so more or less like a mediator between you and the supernatural power. That is the king role. And then why would after his death you are going to make so many of male? Okay. Even if in archaeological context, if I get it, if, if it is gets buried, then what happens is that copper starts dis disintegrating fast. Cell would remain. And then I will get the only skull with the different perforation, I would interpret it as paleopathology. I would say there is some war, whatever interpretation you will do. it, And that problem remained with me for years. 
I could never solve it for few years. Then I start getting a village in Jadwa, which is in Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, you get the village where you start getting the typical pot, very typical pot. And in that pot, you get skull and you get consul, and this is commoners. Because for wrong family, you have a grave, cyst burial. For commoner, you just put it under a tree and only skull. This is secondary burial. Secondary burial concept will be different. Then uh, when I go to the village, I say, where are the skull? No, no, we don't make any open burial, secondary burial anymore. But you go to potters, they make this pot. Very funny. This pot, which is an unfired pot of typical style without any neck, is only used for grave. That means grave tradition was there. You just have to go a little interior. And the future of all this museum collection is now to work with the people from whom the objects were collected. Collection of data and objects were done, as I said, unequal society, thus giving rise to many misconceptions and gaps in information about the collection. The Nagas were exotic to the Westerners. Similarly, some questions and collections of the data and objects about their culture were matter of curiosity. For the Nagas, consequently, ignored pride might have led to give superficial glory because everybody comes, ask me about my culture. Then I try to balloon it little more, little more, little more. And I want to polish it little more because slowly, slowly I hear, Are my story I represented across seven sea. Then what would you say? Only say the good thing, which is good to you. But you think good. Original story is not passed on because you never made Nagas equal. And then comes the story is after a few years, I was invited to a festival where I see this person with whom I work every day, he was my informer and he was a son of a king, of older days king but now king. On a specific day, he comes up with leaf and on that the concern. Because in the lifetime, the way they are decorated, the people who have inherited certain ornaments by doing certain duty, social duty or certain valor, when they die, they do bury their skull in that fashion. Though when he was alive, of course, there is no perforation done. But when his father dies, that's what they do with the skull. So this representation, any museum has it. And again, another thing, commoners. Look at the entire council is used as a bench. Entire council. And again, the question I had is this. As council here. I was surprised, why a council? What did he do? No, Naga makes a council like Orissa. Nobody makes it. There's nothing called fest religious festival. But then what you see in the society, that's why it goes the deeper, there, there is still the tradition. And then also I happen to attend, but this is my father Vetho, not by me. This photograph, when a king expires, for seven days the bodies are kept. This is again photograph 1996 by Father Beto. And look at, he has expired, it is already on the fourth day. Look at how he is decorated. And this decoration on the head is not to any commoner, only to the people who have got fertility in the form of head, those deaths in the form of head hunting to the village. This is not given to everybody. But in the museum, they are displayed as ornaments, that's all. And there are again number of beads. We, we talk about Nagas use beads. We don't, we fail to understand the sky color bead can only be owned by the king. And the sky color bead is heirloom. When, uh, if I'm a king, if I die, I will give it to my son. It will not be put on my grave. Grave will not have sky color beads. And one of the uh, uh, Ong, to whom I happened to meet when he was alive, and you can read, I don't have to, this is a very interesting memory stone, where everybody 
you can, I don't have to read it, you read it, what is written? Agam Rogam, popularly known as Kappa, born in 1923, died in 2001. I was lucky enough to meet him twice. He succeeded a person who is the arm of Sengang village, which is when you go to Mon, you get this village. He was a great preserver of his traditional heritage. And that traditional heritage, which we say our traditional heritage is different, that is different. That traditional heritage is represented in the form of survived by four aunts, 18 wives, 19 sons, seven daughters, 15 and grandchildren. A hero who hunted 36 heads and ruled his territory in prosperity. Despite all his opposition in his period, his follower hunted 130. As he ultimately accepted Christianity and was baptized on 5 1992 And his grave would have been altogether different if he was allowed to live in his tradition, not baptized. But his grave today has this stone. Originally, it would have been altogether different. Many denser people would have represented, and there are many photographs of that. And uh, local name, and use of the same objects of each Naga artifacts varies from group to group and subgroup to subgroups, thus requiring one to do an integrated study of the collector's tour diary, tour route, communication diaries, the collection, and most importantly, revisiting the field to first identify the subgroups and the villages from whom and where the objects are collected. And then the collection of local name and other details of the same. And we also know if the object is still in use or no. If so, then the variable or dynamic meaning and use of the object along with the oral tradition about the object among various groups should be collected and recorded. Such evaluation and re-evaluation of the collected objects by both scholar and natives contextualize the statics and start walking through the life. And such effect will take the subject of ethnography closer to the science. And the possibility is bring the material, selected material, back to Naga society. Put them in Naga hills. Leave it for a year. Let the Naga come and visit it. Let the Naga write different comment. Each Naga group will interpret each object differently. Then the entire the museum will get also more story. And when you propose that, the museum says no. Because they find they are not part and parcel of any more existing society. But I did show you, even if secondary burial is there, life, the, they are part and parcel of their still prevailing society, it's a matter of allowing them to explore. So in that way, I made a form where I make a object name. And then at this point of time, I take photograph of different, all those, I must be having about 10,000 photographs of different museums across the world. I bring them, I make a 3D model, I put them into the Naga society. Then I will collect the data in different Naga society of the same object. And that happens in rain festival, sometimes it is agriculture festival, sometimes part of hunting festival, sometimes part of fishing community, sometimes part of stone pulling. So you get more data about it. And I did say you that the <coughs> tradition now is in transition. Uh, the Ong I did so, there is another Ong. When he expires now, instead of Naga grave, now Christian graves are given. The graves are given like Christian, yet the Y post, which is part of again fertility, is erected. And thus, Nagas now look at this person um, who has tattoos on her face, who is a cognac ong, who has come to her his own granddaughter's marriage. And he, though he has put a cloth because it was December. Look at his face, he finds lost. He just finds lost himself. 
about his own culture because he looks at everything is different. There is modern Christian marriage, all party are going on, Mithun are given, but nobody who is a tattoo. Nobody which will speak for itself is there. The quantity of material in the museum raises a series of questions. For example, why are these objects here? Where exactly are they from? Who made them? And who used them? And what made Nagas to go for such specific material? Such questions lead ultimately to the ultimate question, who are the Nagas? And with changing times, a possibility of exploring a thematic change in approach of museum collection has become a necessity. While attracting the people from exposed societies, ethnology museums should try to reach to the place of collection where the items collected a century or more ago are still in, but they are still in use, or the facts about them are still available in folklore. This will help in obtaining the contextual data, and this will make the static object which are in the glass work in the village. Thank you. I think I took a long walk. Yeah, no. Thank you very much, Alok. His talk was so relevant for everything we do in a museum. So, so relevant. So you have to think of context. You have to do proper investigation. Everything he said was so important. And uh, anyway, I'd like to thank you very much for coming. His father was a doctor, and he grew up among the Bondas, Bondas and Guangs, which are tribes in Odisha. And that's how he got interested in indigenous peoples and indigenous technology. So thank you very much. A small, small gift.